Welcome to this special edition of The Money Movement. I'm joined here today with Dante Desparte, Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy at Circle. I'm Jeremy Lair, Co-Founder, Chairman, and CEO at Circle. And we want to bring you into a conversation that we think is of vital importance, a national conversation, part of a broader international discussion about the future of digital currency, its role in the global economic system, and specifically the question of how the United States can win in what is increasingly being considered a digital currency space race for preeminence of currency on the internet. We're gonna explore this topic through a number of different lenses and discuss in detail what we believe the possibilities are for the United States. So first of all, I wanna welcome you, Dante, to the conversation. Thanks, Jeremy. Great to, great to be back on the Money Movement and share a virtual stage with you again on this, on this important topic. So I, I think, you know, just to frame this a little bit, we're, we're entering potentially an epic of global competition for internet currencies. And there's, there's very clearly a lot happening here, but digital currencies themselves are proliferating. We're seeing these technology breakthroughs in how value is stored, transferred, used on the internet. And we've watched the internet sweep over the world of information, communications, commerce. And we're now at the front edge of the internet sweeping over and transforming economic and financial systems. And so clearly this is a, the economic infrastructure layer of the internet is being built. And so in parallel to this, there is a race. And it's increasingly clear that there's an open question of what will be the dominant currencies of the internet? Will the currency of the internet be the US dollar? Will it be the Chinese digital yuan? Will it be Bitcoin? And I think people are starting to grapple with the implications of this, how profound this is, and, and that this potentially hastens a kind of reconfiguration in the international monetary system. So this is a high stakes competition that is going to shape political and economic systems and value systems in this kind of digitally native global economy. And the, the question that I guess we're asking is, can the US win this digital currency space race? Dante, I'd love you to, to share your thoughts at a high level, like what are the stakes? What is happening here? What is playing out as we see China launching an ECNY embedded in its form of governance? And we see ideas being discussed around, you know, should the federal government be building technology in this category to compete? And then obviously what's happening with crypto more broadly. What do you think this global competition and the framing of this kind of question really looks like? Yeah, I mean, first you, you, you laid the stakes out, I think, really powerfully um, about exactly where we are, the point in time and where we are. I think one thing that's interesting to note is this question of what should the central bank policy response and sort of the, therefore the national economic policy response be to a world in which you have all of these alternative methods of transferring value at scale. And up until very recently, many of the things that, that you have been building and that Circle stands for might have been considered fringe finance, you know cryptography, payments on the internet, blockchain-based payment systems, even Bitcoin. Um, only up until very recently did, did this sort of start to really garner the attention of, of the world. And it's an industry that is not too big to fail in sort of systemic risk parlance, but is now too big to ignore. But there's also a point in time in which central banks started paying very careful attention to the question of digitizing their national thrift. And, and it was around 2019 that the idea of a central bank digital currency stopped being an abstraction that was very interesting to technocrats and started becoming a real experiment. And so some, something like 90% of the world's central banks are debating this question of should they digitize their currency? And if so, how do they do it? And what does that form factor look like? Um, I've argued, and you and I have argued, that you know, at, at current rate, the United States is not necessarily losing this digital currency space race. 
in no small measure because the sum of digital currencies in circulation today reference the dollar. And so if, if in fact that form factor is starting to already take shape, um, then, then at current rate, the U.S. may be very well winning this digital currency space race. But that leadership is not assured as a long-term, um, a long-term posture. So I, I think this concept that we're already we're already winning. I want to come back to that as we talk about like like the digital dollar ecosystem as it exists today. But this I think this this bigger concept that there's a new infrastructure layer, a new economic infrastructure layer, and it's not just about the digitization of national currency. It's about a, a kind of fundamental infrastructure that value coordination, capital markets, commerce. The, the sort of innovation curve of the internet applied to the financial system, which I think magnifies this beyond just a, hey, this is a payment system innovation and into a, wow, this is actually potentially the future of the way economic activity and the, the whole world works um, is, is in some ways, you know, framing how strategic and, and important this is at, at, a, at a national level. Um, it kind of, leads to this kind of second critical theme. So we know this is of like incredible national competitive and, 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 and whatnot importance, but this sort of second piece, which is what can we learn from the open internet, right? We, we, we have this robust infrastructure globally that was built up over 20, 30 years of open source technology, of open protocols, of open permissionless access. And we're seeing that repeated again, right? The open internet of value has animated really over the last decade. I mean, I got going on Circle nine years ago and, and, and this industry precedes, precedes Circle, certainly. Um, over the last decade, I mean, literally tens of thousands of software engineers, entrepreneurs, mathematicians, professionals out of law and finance and just sort of other creators in literally every corner of the world kind of working feverishly to build this new internet native system of value exchange. And so we've seen this sort of open internet of value and this commitment to build it and following the path of the way the internet has grown as well, this open, global, transparent, interoperable, decentralized system. And th this is a particular vision of the world. And it is, in fact, a, an evolution of the world we live in. And, you know, this, I think, in some ways, when you look at what's happened, right, dollar digital currencies, aka stable coins, right, they're actually at the forefront of this. They're actually one of the biggest pieces of this and are growing extremely fast. And actually, it may be that this open internet of value and what's been building up from all of these people all around the world is actually offering the United States a rapid path to establishing the dollar as the currency of the internet. And I, and I, I oftentimes feel like the discussion around building a CBDC or what should this response be or the policy response is about containing risk kind of misses this big picture of what's being built an open internet of value and how are you thinking about explaining that pillar of you know uh, uh, the, the sort of model that can actually lead the US to win and that maybe already is leading the US to win yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you, you you rightly summarized that in a world in which this is now a near three trillion dollar um, sort of innovation and asset class, the the simplest way of reducing the message to policymakers, central bankers, regulators, and others is to say it is the rails, stupid, not anything else. And and I don't mean that pejoratively. It's it's that the competition is not the form factor nor the economic soundness of a stable coin. I think we've largely settled um, what that may look like, that it should be as close to cash-like in its properties as possible and should solve for the buyer's and spender's remorse that plagued very early cryptocurrencies and negated the payments advantages, but that the rails and the idea of building a non-proprietary technology 
this third generation of the web is in fact the most powerful innovation that underpins all of it. And that we're still very much, as I said recently in, in, um, in some hearings in the Senate, and, and you had to testify in the House not long ago about, the idea here is that while the internet of value may very well be in its dial-up phase, the underpinning of the public infrastructure and public blockchains is itself part of the digital public goods and the digital commons on which the financialization, the economic activity, and the remaining activity of a world in which if data is in fact the new form of, then these public blockchains are the barrels that the barrels that will ultimately allow for all of these other economic activities to take root. I think that's the fundament, fundamental breakthrough. And candidly, it's as powerfully aligned to many first principles that underpin the United States. The idea of, you know, the motto of this country is a pluribus unum out of many one, that you have a chance to really build this in a manner in which, unlike the tech titan wave, in which all the value went to a, a small handful of postal codes in the United States, the blockchain ecosystem and this third generation of the web is really being built across the country from sea to shining sea. And increasingly, not only is the dollar the currency of reference, but the U.S. is increasingly the jurisdiction uh, that these developers are calling home. I think that's powerful. We don't want to let that pass us by. Yeah, I mean, I think this, um, you know, it, em embracing what, what the public good of the Internet can bring and em embracing that with the economic system with the dollar is, is really profound. I think we'll come back to sort of the values that are that that are sort of rooted in this and contrast that with the values of an alternative vision of the world, one that is often embraced by authoritarian governments. Um, but you know, I, I think it's it's helpful here to in in, in making the case that you know today's you know digital dollar ecosystem you know, when you look at it, what's happening today, you know, almost by nearly, you know, every measure, the U.S. and the U.S. dollar are winning. And so as we think about, you know, should the government administer something uh, or, uh, you know, which is something that could take many, many years to develop, poses a whole set of its own risks and pitfalls, which we'll talk about, you know, the market and the open internet are, are racing ahead. And we, we can talk directly about from our own vantage point, what we, what we see. And so just I'll summarize a few things and then we can reflect on it, but, you know, USDC, which is already regulated is a full reserved dollar digital currency. Um, there's an entire global ecosystem of developing around these digital dollars and, and these digital dollars are held in the care and custody of, of, of the U.S. financial system, um, and you know that when you think about the scale, it's it's incredible, and we're still in the early stages. So we've we've seen over a hundred billion USDC issued. There's over forty eight billion in circulation today. Um, that's over ten thousand percent growth over two years. So this is happening at at an incredible rate. In two thousand and twenty one. In just the year 2021, we saw over $2.5 trillion in on blockchain payments and settlements with USDC and nearly 5 million active wallet addresses. Many of those active wallet addresses, you know, with custodial services and other services that touch tens of millions of users. So we're seeing this incredible amount of, of emerging activity. And I think the, the power of the openness is, is a huge part of that. So there's not a single company building a digital wallet to support the digital dollars that are out there. There are today, just looking at the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, there are over 220 different digital wallet apps that can transact in USDC. And those are available in 175 countries. So already, digital dollars in the form of digital currency there's hundreds of, of third-party wallet applications available nearly all around the world to any user. Um, and, and that's also you know, connected to you know, dozens of leading regulated exchanges in over 100 that are accessible in over 180 countries that allow for trading, converting, and providing kind of liquidity and convertibility into key currency markets around the world. And so the market for these digital currency dollars and how they can move around the world to countries in and out of currencies is already there. 
And then again, kind of talking about the the infrastructure and the openness, you know, USDC is is programmable, blockchain protocols, DeFi protocols, NFT markets, but all of these, you know, developments of new value added ways to utilize money on the internet. There's literally over 200 blockchain protocols that support USDC today. Um, and hundreds of regulated financial institutions in the form of VASTs, which are the regulated digital asset firms that exist in nearly all of the financial centers in the world supporting USDC. So here we are, trillions of transactions, 100 billion plus of issuance, a proliferating ecosystem of firms. And I guess the point here is like digital dollars are winning. Like no other country can say that there's an ecosystem like that behind its digital currency on the internet. And I, I think, you know, th this is, again, when people often talk about, should we build something? What should we do? There, there's a lot there already. Um, and, you know, the, the, the kind of question I, I have for you is, what does this look like in three to five years? Because if the federal government's going to build a technology, and, and again, there's a whole set of questions around what that even means. Um, what does it look like if we unleash and continue to see the development of the open, open innovation on the internet and, and you know, open source innovation and private market innovation? What does this look like in three to five years? Are we going to achieve the objectives that people are, are, are focused on? Well, no question. I think everything you summarized is, is a conversation that you and I often have and, and is a recurring conversation about what happens when money collides with Moore's law, collides with sort of network effects and open innovation. And I think the ability to report that this is already a global phenomenon, that, that it's already catalyzing competition. And candidly, a number of policy priorities that I think are very consistent with what you're hearing from central banks, including the Fed in the United States, about what is the motivation and the central sort of tenets of a central bank digital currency, to the extent a lot of those policy priorities can be met by a free market, then always bet on a free market. And one of the challenges, obviously, that central bank digital currencies potentially pose irrespective of whether they're a retail innovation or a wholesale innovation, is it means the public sector has to make a hundred year technology bet at least. And in that spirit, it's always better to bet on a free open market that's competitive and that can operate enshrined around a series of rules and principles and regulatory standards around protecting innovation, promoting inclusion, lowering fundamental costs, increasing competition and openness. There is no better standard, candidly, than open innovation to build a global payment system and an economic economic system that raises prosperity. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and so I think, you know, that whole premise, we're only in the opening rounds. And I think in three to five years, the technology starts to fade to the background and the experience given companion innovations around digital identity and other things that are on the near horizon is you start to create a world in which there's no longer an excuse for, for global payments to be as free and interoperable as possible. And then all of the other economic activities that we've discussed to uh, come to the foreground. I mean, it's, 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 it's so interesting. I, I mean, this, this sort of, you're emphasizing like the power of free markets, the power of open innovation, the, the power of these value systems of openness and privacy preservation and 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 the like, which you know have in some ways, right? They've helped America lead for decades now in internet technology industries and standards, um, and they they work, right? And so, and in fact, those are underpinning already what is allowing this flourishing market for digital currency and blockchain technology to to build today. But there's a kind of um, alternative view and it, and it still feels like a lot of the policy narrative and discussion is you know how do we constrain what's happening here or um or or how do we nationalize the technology and infrastructure or launch and administer you know government controlled um you know digital currencies we're seeing that happen in 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 countries where the government nationalizes and, and operates a lot of things um, in contrast to the West. Um, you know, what do you think is behind that, uh, that kind of 
posture, that kind of instinct from a policy perspective to to sort of seek to, as you like to say, out China, China. <laughs> well, as as a as a person who has spent an enormous amount of time on sort of global risk and and man made risk and political risk, I think the the tendency of repressive countries, whenever there is a civil uh, manifestation or, or a civil sort of uh, demonstration of um, democratic values or tendencies, uh, the first thing they cut is the internet. And that tells you a lot. And I think the idea that there is a potential for an internet of value to emerge that enshrines in, um, you know, individuals armed with little more than a, a, a mental memory wallet of their keywords and passphrases um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, safety keys of of their digital wallet, the ability to transfer their value across borders, as you like to say that there is no such thing as a cross border. When was the last time you sent a cross border email? That to the extent your your value can now travel with you, irrespective of the country you live in, I think it's a very very powerful ideal. We have a shot. It's that's why I think the the West is winning the digital currency space race at the moment. We have a shot at at um, really enshrining that over the long haul, and and with it also ensuring that many other countries around the world are not left behind. But it, it tells you a lot that the first instinct of repressive countries, given the shot, is to cut the ties to the internet because of what it fundamentally represents. And there is no stronger value, no stronger democratic tendency. And this is frankly why blockchain is such a powerful movement um, than to also enshrine the democratization of assets and economic value. We live in a world where I think brick and mortar infrastructure, brick and mortar banking, brick and mortar public policy has all reached a point of diminishing returns. And then the COVID-19 pandemic has really demonstrated for us how, how true it is that but for technology at the core of so many systems, we would have a massive global business continuity problem. And I think that exists today across a, a, across a spectrum of activities. And so Central banks of the world would be wise not to try to keep up with international competition for digital currencies that are entirely centralized. Allow the free market to bloom. You'll have an embarrassment of riches and economic activity on the other side of it. And you'll have an air gap between the central bank, your wallet, and how you spend your money, which is a feature, not a bug. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, right, there, there are sort of multiple policy responses here. And, and we're seeing that squarely in front of us, right? We've got the the White House, the administration, Congress thinking about, wow, private market innovation with crypto, crypto infrastructure, stable coins, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we think about this? How do we regulate it? How do we enable it? You know, there's sort of a whole policy response there. And kind of on the other side of this, you've got, you know, an open kind of request for comments on, you know, should the Federal Reserve build a, a, a central bank digital currency and, and, and looking at that. And I want to focus on the latter here first. You know, th there are real risks and pitfalls with central bank digital currency. You've just touched on, on some of those. Um, but what are some of the other kind of fundamental risks that you see that policymakers need to be thinking about. Obviously, there's a question of how to sort of foster and enable and ensure that what's already happening can secure the role of the dollar, which we can touch on a little bit more because there, there is room for more national policy on that front. But what are the what are the fundamental risks that exist in a path where, say, there is a three to five year project to try and have the federal government build a technology. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there there are a couple. One, we would transmit to the taxpayer hundreds of billions of dollars of open R and D, open research and development, open open sort of infrastructure that's being developed in a free market that is going from the dial up phase to the broadband phase of this Internet of Value without a, the taxpayer paying a single penny. And, and I think transmitting that from an open market, free market set of economic and competitive activity to taxpayer born R&D and science projects um, is, is, I think, frankly, patently un-American. And, and, and it sort of blunts competition because ultimately the public sector then has to pick technology winners and losers and do so in a manner that would survive technological obsolescence. 
Then you have all of the other attendant risks that come with that. Um, the transmission of mon monetary policy in the United States and in many other countries around the world flows through the two-tiered banking system. And a central bank digital currency potentially introduces a safer or at least a perceived safer asset, which would then put downward pressure on um, the two-tiered banking system and, and traditional bank deposits. Um, it then raises privacy questions, deplatforming questions, cyber risk questions, and a whole host of other questions. The last point I would make is that the dollar is a global reserve currency and is used all over the world. And the ability to guarantee that the dollar would be present and acceptable in those last mile domains where it may exist all over the planet rides in no small measure on consortium rails or the combination of private sector activity and public oversight. I think that too is is negating the upgrade of the dollar to exist in cryptographic form as a digital currency or a stable coin, that it's now enabling the dollar to sort of live in a 24 seven always on manner. Um, so I think those are just a, a, a small slew of the policy responses. But you also know, Jeremy, that you're living in sort of the policy upside down when fintechs, banks, and uh, crypto companies all have common cause in thinking a central bank digital currency is a bad idea. The Bank Policy Institute, the America's Banker Bankers Association all wrote long letters in opposition to a CBDC on the grounds that it would ultimately fundamentally blunt competition and economic competitiveness in the country in the long run. I mean, I, I think the, the case can certainly be made that there is this incredible innovation that's happening and that's actually how you're gonna win, right? So if the question is what ensures the preeminence of the dollar in the age of the internet and the age of the internet economy. And that's really the question, you know, and, and this is when you read an editorial from the Financial Times or you read, uh, you know, you know, stump speeches uh, by, 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 by various policymakers and others, right? What people care about is the dollar. And in a world where the technological innovation in the form factor and in the availability and the openness is already being driven. It's being driven at an incredible pace. It seems like the, 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 the policy response isn't that the federal government needs to go build this. It's actually, it's happening and it's here, which kind of leads to the other kind of piece of this, which is the, the answer is not do nothing, right? The answer is not, you know, laissez-faire. There's just this, uh, you know, endless free market innovation and there are no policy and regulatory issues at all. There are significant issues, but we're at a crossroads in what that policy posture should be. And I think, you know, we're of the view that it is actually time to establish policies that help the dollar uh, become the most trusted and widely used currency on the internet. And I think the, 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 the real thing that we're starting to see emerge is not a bipartisan view, a nonpartisan view that the U.S. needs to lead in this space. It needs to embrace and safely regulate an industry that is already demonstrating incredible capabilities and potential and, and can accelerate the U.S., economic competitiveness and the role of the dollar. Um, but there, there have to be, there are fundamental risks and there have to be policies and, and likely, you know, federal statutes and supervision at the, at the Treasury Department level and, and others. What are the policy pillars that are needed to both enshrine and enable and allow this industry and technology to flourish and safely grow? Yeah, I mean, it, first of all, I completely agree. And policymakers and regulators don't like things that get very big, very quick. And I think when when the internet collides with money, then it starts to enjoy the very properties of the internet and the type of exponential growth and scale that the internet produces. But it's not to assume that it is an unchecked risk, and 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 that there are no ways of sort of enshrining the public interest in 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 this in innovation and in this industry. And I think there are really three policy pillars that are going to be very enduring. Um, one, these innovations should promote inclusion in its broadest form. Um, I think that's that's something you hear consistently from central banks and you hear it in Washington and from the Fed. Two, it should promote um, responsible financial services innovation. 
And then three, it should not come at the expense of the integrity of the financial system. And I think those three broad pillars can be held. But it's also important to guard against the tendency of what I call monetary airline miles, stablecoin innovations that are otherwise riding on closed rails and closed payment systems are going to do very little for protecting and defending the broad range U.S. interest in Web3, in this open third generation of the internet, the, the defense of that really hinges on building for broad interoperability and proprietary rails, closed payment systems, things that might look very safe, but in the long run are only beneficial to creating a walled garden for payments are not necessarily going to advance U.S. interest. And, and I think broad policy interests around interoperability and fundamental competition and payments and money and all of these other economic activities. So I think that that to me is one of the big fights that remains in the policy environment is to really outline and narrate how Web3 is in its dial-up phase, but the technology is not standing still. And some of the adverse external impacts that, that these early generation technologies are having can all be um, negated and improved upon because the technologists are consistently building. But I think broadly, the policy pillars can be guarded um, at every level. And, and the more the policy environment starts to favor that, the better in the long run, and frankly, the better for U.S. Uh, economic competitiveness. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right on the, you know, with, with dollar stable coins, you know, clearly, you know, safety and liquidity of funds, you know, that back these digital currencies, you know, ensuring that mechanisms for digital identity, uh, and 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 anti money laundering can function on public internet infrastructure that is not administered and controlled by a single private corporation or the government, but finding ways to deal with some of these fundamental risks, but doing it in a way which protects and preserves privacy, provides the kind of security assurances that blockchains and cryptography present, um, but also make it difficult for you know, bad, bad actors to 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 thrive. Um, so those there's clearly the need for for these. And as you were describing, kind of the fundamental market integrity risks um, that exists, and 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 why you have kind of supervised and licensed you know firms at a at a at a federal level. So um, cl clearly, there's room here for policy to respond to the the growth. And the risks that that presents, but but in a way which I think embraces a lot of the other things that that we've been talking about. You know, I think kind of kind of from a concluding thoughts perspective. I mean, I know our view is sort of the time is now, right? This is a this is a this is a pivotal moment. It's a pivotal moment where this is being considered and discussed. It's a pivotal moment. China is putting the ECNY into the hands of a billion WeChat users, and I think seeks to take that approach and export it globally. And so the US does need to respond, but also it's not just responding, it's actually acknowledging that the open internet and the free market alternatives are actually already thriving and winning. So, you know, it's sort of established clear and sound policies let American industry build and compete at internet speed you know, and win the race to put the dollar into the hands of every internet user in the world. I mean, this is, this is what's available to us. And, you know, I, I, I really, you know, deeply hope that leaders in the financial system and the policy community uh, can kind of consider all this, but I, I'd love Dante for your, your kind of closing thoughts on, on where we are and where we need to go. Indeed, and, and I think the, the, the framing of this as zero sum um, would be in many ways a mistake. Uh, I think the, the framing here is, is there's a net gain, right? In the same way that you know, principles like democracy itself and fundamental trust in the dollar as a global currency is the sum of all the parts. Uh, the former Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, wrote a piece in Foreign Policy that, you know, a digital twin of a flawed currency imports all of the aspects and the institutions and value systems of those institutions in that country. And I think 
to assume that we have no need to innovate in the form factor of the dollar and to import it onto the internet in a safe and sound manner that 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 allows for this type of competition in an always on global economy where your and my banking and financial needs don't take breaks um, would be a, would be a sign of hubris as a country. And I think if there's one indictment I have as someone who spent a career in trying to advance US policy on resilience and technology and competitiveness, if there's one small indictment, it was it's to assume that the innovation is going to stand still and wait for us to figure it out. I, I think that's the one one sort of you know small indictment. I think broadly we're winning this race today. I don't think it's zero sum, but I, I do think the president's working group report missed a preamble. It should have included at the outset a preamble that outlined what the opportunities were, but it was very heavy on the risks. I think the Fed's report, by contrast, on central bank digital currencies is right in not doing it first, but rather getting it right. And I think a part of getting it right in the United States and a part of getting it right in competing globally is to enable a responsible a private sector to thrive and to enshrine the value systems of a country and the value systems of its institutions in what that open competition looks like. Well said. Um, good conversation. Hopefully for everyone who's listening or watching, informative for you. This is a major national debate. <laughs> this is a major national issue. And it will be exciting to see what unfolds in the coming year. Mm -hmm.